recording. And I'm a little confused here. This is the, this is supposed to be the screen that I'm recording on. Um, I, let's see, it says here, you are screen sharing. I'm just worried. Can you guys see this screen? Let me get a chat thing going here. Can you, can you see the screen with the, the screen that, that my mouse is moving on? Okay, so you can see the correct screen. Okay, good. Um, I forgot to connect the uh, to connect the iPad. Let me disconnect the backup hard drive. So what I'm going to do is uh, first review um, Langevin's theory of Brownian motion and. and uh, the nice thing about it is that it's quite simple. It's just <clears throat> basically freshman physics, most of it. Um, mass times acceleration is force. Now this force has two components. There's a drag because of viscosity, and then there's a random force. And so when you take the, the average, you get, um, uh, this expression that MA on average is equal to the um, uh, drag force. And um, this parameter B, which is called the mobility, is um, written in various ways. Uh, um, it's written as tau over M. And um, By the way, the reason why everything is a little upset today is that um, we're driving a Kia. Our main car is a Kia. And let me tell you, never buy a Kia. Um, and the trunk opened while my wife was on the highway and she nearly had an accident. So I had to report it to the government. And um, uh, Kia people in Albuquerque uh, at Fiesta Kia, they're totally unresponsive. Um, so let's see if I can get um, notes going here. Notes. I've switched to dark mode in notes and um, I think it's, it, it's, it looks much nicer. Um, I think those colors look really great in dark mode. Um, and let's make this bigger. Okay, so we went through this uh, before and um, Uh, what you have here then is uh, a formula, is a differential equation that you can solve. It's just, it's one of our favorite differential equations because it's so simple. So the average velocity is the initial velocity, the average initial velocity then decreasing like that. And um, if you now divide the instantaneous equation by M, you get uh, this expression here where this is a random acceleration. And then you multiply that, you dot that into R and this averages to zero. So you have this equation, but then you realize that the time derivative of the square of the position is, the, is twice the position dotted into the velocity. And, um, then um, 
if you take the second derivative of that, well, you're differentiating this expression here. And so you get r dot dv dt plus uh, v squared. And then if you take the average of this, you get, you get this expression here. Um, uh, I don't know why these, these, oh yeah, these two equations are almost the same, but uh, 143 tells us we can make this substitution. And um, then one can replace using 144. We, by the way, somebody is making a lot of noise. Could the person making the noise please mute himself or herself? Um, anyway, we get down to this expression and which involves the average value of V squared, but the average value of V, v squared is three KT over M. And um, so now we have, this assumes that our particle is in a liquid or a gas and is at equilibrium. Um, Uh, so we then get this expression here, which we can then integrate. It's a second order differential equation uh, that's inhomogeneous. This is a particular solution. And then we have to satisfy, we have to, this is the general solution of the homogeneous equation we solve for U and V. And we eventually get this expression here. Um, as I go through this, I must say, I'm a little wondering whether, yeah, I suppose the idea here is, is that in a liquid, um, the number of collisions per second is something like 10 to the 21, which is really extraordinary. In a gas, of course, it's much less, but it, it you know, if, if you, make it a thousand times less, that's still 10 to the 18 per second. And if you go down another thousand, that's 10 to the 15. And you go down another thousand, it's 10 to the 12. So whatever it is, you're getting to equilibrium almost instantaneously on the scale of hours um, or even minutes or seconds. Um, so this is the equation we get for the average value of R squared. And um, uh, for long times, times long compared to tall, we simply get this expression here. And um, the diffusion constant is defined by definition to, by this equation. And so um, in that way, comparing these two, we get a formula for the diffusion constant and um, or equivalently, um, it, it, zeta is called the viscous friction coefficient. By the way, the notation in this field is um, not uniform or standardized. There are many different versions. Anyway, zeta is one over uh, B, one over the mobility. And so then we have zeta D is KT. In any event, um, uh, there's a, a formula for either the mobility or for the viscosity or for the viscous friction coefficient. And it's related to the viscosity of the liquid or the gas. And Stokes worked out a formula for it. Um, and since it's M over tau, effectively, we didn't really need to have zeta in there. Anyway, if it's M over tau, well, actually, no, let's stay with zeta or one over B. His uh, formula for that was six pi a to the viscosity and r the radius of the uh, particle that's moving around in this fluid or gas. Um, and um, you may say, well, uh, how did he work that out? Well, let me just point out that we know what the units are here. The units of zeta are mass divided by time. And we know it has to be proportional to the viscosity and so by and proportional to the radius. And once you put in those two, you have the right unit. So the only other thing is a numerical factor. And um, this turns out to be a little larger than 18. 
Um, and as I said, Stokes worked it out for a sphere. Um, if, the, if the shape is a little different, then it's a little different from the six pi. In any event, that's the uh, formula. And then the, the important thing about this historically is that these equations allow one to calculate Boltzmann's constant, namely that Boltzmann's constant is six pi eta rho times the diffusion constant divided by the temperature. And those were all things people could measure 121 years ago. Um, actually, it was, or I think it was probably 1905 or so when Einstein worked this out. And that meant that people could calculate Boltzmann's constant. And that was the first time they could actually reliably calculate Boltzmann's constant which turns out to be about 6, 10 to the 23rd. That enabled them to calculate the masses of atoms and molecules. And um, so that was a big advance uh, conceptually, um, especially in chemistry, because it validated what the chemists were doing. Um, anyway, if, if you uh, add to um, the uh, Langevin uh, description, a constant force, QE, then um, the equations uh, become just a little bit more complicated. You get an extra acceleration here. And a uh, particular solution now is um, just this. And um, uh, what, what one gets after that is this is the, then the Einstein, the formula for the uh, diffusion constant. Um, and um, here I've written mu as QB. It's, so the ratio of these two is B. Um, So what? Uh, so what's the application to uh, coronavirus in air? Well, it's that um, uh, and the aerosol particles that are um, uh, of interest in uh, the transmission of uh, COVID uh, and probably of the common cold and other and the flu and so forth. They're part. They're aerosol particles of range between 0.05 microns, that's really small, and five microns. And um, by the way, the size of a bacterium is roughly a micron. Um, so these are quite small. And remember, a, a virus particle is very small compared to the size of a cell. Um, so this is the size range that's of interest, spheres of water um, in which there's, there's one or more or several or hundreds of virus particles in a sphere. And this is emitted when one speaks or sings or coughs or sneezes or just breathes. If you're infected, you're spreading these things. The question is, um, what happens to them? And now if you don't take into account um, the, um, the viscosity of air, then you imagine that they just fall to the ground immediately. And then, and you get the advice that people gave us at the start of uh, COVID-19, which was wash your hands and um, don't touch anything um, and stay six feet apart. Um, after a while, though, people realized that the transmission could be airborne, and eventually people realized that it was essentially airborne. And the reason for that is that uh, if we take this, these formulas seriously, then what do we find? Well, um, here's a, uh, the case of R equal to 10 to the minus seven meters, which is a 10th of a micron which is basically twice the, min the minimum range. 
Um, and um, it's in a gravitational field. So we just replace E, a QE with MG. And um, then what we get is that the average position uh, or at least the change in the average position is minus G uh, tau times T. Namely, where we go back to this formula here, one, six, seven, this is the average position and this is the average uh, uh, variance here. This is the variance here. Um, and um, well, what is tau? So let me uh, see what tau is. Well, T is much greater than tau. Why is that? Well, tau, let's see, I didn't, I should have written down a formula for tau here for you. Um, uh, the parameter, so it's given by this and damn it, I should have said what it was or plotted it. At any rate, it's very small. So T over tau is um, an absolutely huge number. I mean, it's like a thousand or more. And consequently, in these expressions, um, T over tau is the dominant factor. You can forget about one and you, completely can, you can completely forget about E to the minus T over tau. So basically we just have Q tau squared E over M where we replace E over M by simply um, let's see, I said E was MG, so it's, this is just G. So this is, um, uh, we get the T and um, we get a tau and uh, yeah, and just a G is all that's left over. Maybe I should just show you that explicitly. So in other words, what we've got here is in the einstein nernst formula, we have here Q, let me write it as QE, tau squared over M times T over tau. So this is QE tau T over M. And um, now we're replacing QE by uh, mg, so this is just g tau t, which is um, what I wrote here. And as I said, tau is given by Stokes's formula for a gas or a fluid of viscosity eta. Eta, it turns out, is this very small number. It's 1.8 times 10 to the minus five kilograms per meter per second. And of course the density of water, if I assume the aerosols are mostly water and frankly to first order, everything biological is mostly water. Um, that's why we're thirsty, why we get thirsty, especially in New Mexico. So um, rho is 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. And so the mass here of this aerosol particle of radius a tenth of a micron is about four times 10 to the minus 18 kilograms. So the time to fall two meters, so I'm imagining a tall person coughing, um, is six pi eta r d, d being the two meters divided by gm. And um, I thought I had added an extra, oh, I did that down here, but not up here. Um, and this turns out to be, um, for D equal two, this turns out to be 1.7 times 10 to the six seconds. And that's almost 20 days. So um, you have a tall person coughing. Um, some of these aerosols are gonna, uh, are gonna be floating around um, for um, two or three weeks. Um, for one micron, it's less by a factor of 100. Um, and uh, the time then is 4.7 hours. 
So this means somebody coughs in uh, the first class and then um, by lunchtime, the virus particles are still in the air. And um, so we really need ventilation uh, to suppress um, not only the common cold, but um, more especially uh, these new viruses and, in espe and especially um, Omicron. Um, There's a correction um, called the Cunningham slip correction. That changes the, the uh, uh, it reduces the time in air slightly, but it's only slightly because here lambda is 68 nanometers and R is um, uh, of the order of a thousand nanometers. And so this, this factor is essentially negligible. Um, and for larger droplets, it's completely negligible. It has a little bit of an effect for the very smallest uh, aerosols. Um, by the way, aerosol is one of these terms that um, drive people who worry about English crazy. Um, <clears throat> apparently, aerosol is defined to be plural and um, Yet we need a word for aerosol, for particles of aerosol, and so we just call them aerosols. And so we just use the plural for many aerosols. Well, I don't know. It's that's probably a good feature of English, namely that mistakes um, eventually become accepted as real English. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them do. Um, so that's, that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, and you can see then that the sort of stuff that um, you've learned in this course um, actually has real uh, uh, implications. And uh, the health implications then are um, that uh, uh, businesses, schools, houses should be well ventilated. Um, and uh, in the summer, we have an enormous advantage in New Mexico, namely that we have such low humidity that we can use swamp coolers to cool uh, houses and schools and so forth. And, um, so, and the advantage of a swamp cooler then is that the flow of air through the house or through the building um, is just such that uh, you just don't need to worry about airborne transmission of, of, of particles, of, uh, of, of virus particles, which are called vir virions, by the way. Anyway, you, you don't need to worry about it at all. On the other hand, in the wintertime, uh, we don't run the swamp coolers, and so we do need to worry about it. And so what we need to do is just um, uh, have as much ventilation as possible. Um, and of course, probably more important is to be fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, uh, so um, having done that, I think I will skip it unless there are objections. I will skip to talk now about path integrals. Um, I think they're something that, uh, that are of interest conceptually. They're, they turn out to be of interest con um, computationally um, as well. Um, and uh, on the other hand, they're, they're not trivial. And so using them sometimes is more trouble than they're worth. Um, so, but that's true of any technique in mathematics or physics. Uh, the, the formulas and concepts that are appropriate for one problem are not the same as those that are appropriate for, uh, for another problem. Um, I, I was told a story about Feynman uh, teaching um, 
either elementary physics or quantum ele or elementary quantum mechanics at Caltech many years ago. And the story was that he decided he was going to teach everything in terms of path integrals. And so he started out teaching path integrals. And, but after, I don't know, a few days or a few weeks, he said, well, the hell with this. Um, let's just do the standard way. It's so much simpler. Um, so let me let me skip now um, uh, to tell you some things about path integrals because I think they're just so um, they're of such great interest. Um, I met Feynman, by the way, um, back um, I guess three decades ago. No, four decades ago, I guess. Anyway, he gave me a ride from the conference to my hotel. He's quite a nice man, actually. Um, always amusing. Uh, always, uh, just a marvelous person. So let's, um, let's start out with just some simple integrals. Um, uh, the integral of a, comp of, a, of a complex Gaussian. This is just a standard formula. And um, uh, the integral of the Fourier transform of a real Gaussian. So this is Fourier transform of a complex Gaussian, real Gaussian, we get these two formulas. And um, if you say, well, we're gonna not just do one, we're gonna do N of them. And uh, so we have uh, a matrix S. Um, so we have a sum over J and K, S, J, K, X, J, X, K, and 2i, C, J, X, J, and we integrate over all the Xs. Well, what you get is a square root i pi to the n over determinant of this matrix S, and um, the inverse of the matrix S, and then you get C on both sides. So this this exponent looks like this, the, the matrix C, C1, Cn, the matrix S, and then the vector C1, Cn. And this isn't the matrix S, this is, this is S inverse here. Um, determinant, uh, A, here this A is the, determined of the matrix A, A is its inverse and sums of course are understood. Um, for the real, uh, for the Fourier transform, the real Gaussian, you get this expression and everything's real on this side, even though it's a Fourier transform. And um, then there's an approximation, um, namely e to the a plus b is the limit so what do we know about e to the a plus b? Well, it's going to be something like e to the a times e to the b. So it's going to be something like this, because the ends all cancel, essentially. Uh, but the other thing about e to the a plus b is that it's neither a nor ordered nor b ordered. It's symmetrically ordered. And that's true if you write it this way. It's symmetrically ordered in a clumsy kind of way. And so this is a this is called Trotter's product formula. Um, and we can use it now in quantum mechanics. Um, we can, first of all, in statistical mechanics, we can use it this way. Suppose beta, of course, normally we say, what is beta? Beta is one over Boltzmann constant, Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. And here's the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, the potential part of the Hamiltonian. So e to the minus beta k plus v. By the way, the difficulty in so much of um, physics is that um, k and v don't commute with each other. If they did, we could just basically diagonalize and we'd be done. But instead, they don't commute. And so we have to do something like this. And the same thing up here, if we want the time evolution operator, then this is e to the minus i th over h bar. So we have this expression here. Um, so these are the, so th these are the, the we're, gonna, we're gonna work on the right-hand sides to create these path integrals. 
And um, if we stay with quantum mechanics, then we want to compute this e to the minus i t b minus t a h over h bar. And as I said, if we are just talking about one dimension particle mass m and one dimension potential v, then what you can do is this you can say h is p squared over 2m plus v of q. And um, you have eigenstates of position and momentum with eigenvalues, uh, the re all real numbers, and these are complete, and uh, their outer products provide expansions for the density, for the identity operator, and the inner product of Q with P is this. And by the way, this is essentially, this is one of the things that distinguishes quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. I mean, you could, Talk classically, you could say this state represents a particle at Q and this state represents a particle at P. And there wouldn't be anything wrong by saying that those were vectors. Um, but then um, you'd have trouble in classical physics saying, well, what the heck, what is the inner product of a vector of a particle at Q with a vector that represents a particle of momentum P? And um, the answer is provided by quantum mechanics and it's given by this phase factor. And so what we're going to do, we need a small number to do anything in physics because we always want to approximate unless we can calculate exactly. So we say epsilon is Tb minus Ta over n and we're going to let n go to infinity. And we take the Hamiltonian over h bar just to be able to write things simply uh, and not to have two, pa, two m h bar and h bar, I'm just going to write them as k plus v. So v is v over h bar, k is p squared over two m h bar. And so the time evolution operator then is this, and we can write it as in terms of Trotter's product formula, it's e to the minus i epsilon k to the minus i epsilon v minus i epsilon k minus i epsilon v dot 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 and you have to have n of these and n goes to infinity so that's the part of the that's what makes path integrals awkward and um they're good for some things but certainly not for everything um so now what we can do is we can compute the average value of the product of these two operators, each of these is unitary, by the way, uh, between a state of position Q1 and a state of position QA. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna insert eigenstates of the momentum operator uh, in the form of a complete set of states. And we're just gonna insert the identity operator here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have here Q1 e to the minus i epsilon k identity operator e to the minus i epsilon v q a. So that's the step that I sort of suppressed here. And the identity operator is this integral of outer products of P prime states, states of precisely momentum P prime. Now, if you use this inner product formula, you can write, um, you can use the inner product formula for this. Uh, the P prime is an eigenstate of P. And so this unitary operator just becomes this phase factor to the minus I epsilon P prime squared over two M H bar, where I've sort of now reverted to standard notation. On the other hand, Q is an eigenstate of QA, the, the ket QA is an eigenstate of the operator Q. And so this becomes just a phase factor. And now we have two inner products and they're both of this form here. And when we combine them, what we get is this. The, we're, not into, we're integrating over P prime so we can bring out this phase factor. And what we have left is is uh, the thing that we started with, namely uh, the Fourier transform of a complex Gaussian. And um, uh, so we just use the formula that I mentioned or quoted or cited in the 
at the beginning of the, this chapter on uh, path integrals and uh, changing P prime to P just to simplify the notation. Oh, and we're gonna make a, a sort of a sleight of hand here uh, notation, a suggestive notation, Q A dot times epsilon is going to be Q1 minus Q A. So that's what this is going to be. So this is a definition of Q A dot. Um, it's not a real time derivative of Q A. And Q A is in any case a variable. So Q A dot is just a different variable. So what do we have then? Um, uh, what we have then is this expression here, and it's the same as 20, 20 20.1 with these substitutions. And so the answer is just this phase factor. And so the upshot is that the, ma the, uh, the matrix element Q1, QA of these two unitary operators is this ordinary integral, this Fourier transform of an imaginary Gaussian, um, and we eventually get this expression here, a square root, and we have e to the i something, epsilon over h bar. Notice this is like the action, this is like the Lagrangian of a free particle, kinetic energy minus potential energy. And so the next step is to say, okay, what's Q2 with that? And uh, in other words, we, we put in, we have the matrix element Q of this e to the minus i k. In other words, the matrix element of the square of the product of these two unitary operators. So we have this one times that one. And now we already have the formula for this one and the formula for that one. We just substitute, it turns out we get this. And now, um, and Q1 dot is just uh, by definition that. And if we stick together or stitch together N of them, what we get is for each one, you see, we get this Lagrangian. And so now, and here we just had to integrate over Q1. Now we have to integrate Q1 up to Qn minus one. And each of them is the Lagrange density times epsilon over h bar times i. And well, letting n go to infinity, what we've got up here is first we have to integrate over all these variables, an infinite number of variables. The phase factor is just the total action divided by h bar times i, and this gives us the time evolution operator of the Qs. Remember, we have this chat thing, so if you wanna shoot me a question, go for it. So the idea is that um, the amplitude to go from, for a particle of mass m to go from QA to QB is, a path integral over all possible paths times uh, weighted by the action of each path. And um, one can write the operator then as this integral of uh, outer products. And this, this DQ, by the way, is, means that we integrate over all the intermediary, intermediary uh, Qs where Q0 is QA, QN is, Q, is, is QB. We've got this crazy factor, the nth power of an imaginary fraction here. Um, and you might wonder, well, boy, this is a pretty crazy number here. I mean, say what you will about, about this thing, but... Um, this factor here is completely crazy. Well, it's not completely crazy. And moreover, the trick when you're using path integrals is that you often compute ratios of path integrals. When you compute ratios of path integrals, these crazy factors uh, cancel. In three-dimensional space, 
Uh, you just have the action of the path in three dimensions, exponentiated I over H bar, and you integrate over all possible paths. So um, what's, what's really one of the conceptual benefits of, of this is that the path integral formula in quantum mechanics then explains why quantum mechanics, why classical mechanics uh, exists and applies. In other words, you can derive classical mechanics from, um, uh, from quantum mechanics and um, from the path integral. And the idea then is that you see, you have to integrate over all paths. So when is this integral big and when is it small? Well, suppose you have, suppose you pick the time interval, you pick your starting point and you ask, can you get to that point? Okay, so let's, let's have the Q axis here and the T axis there. And so we're starting, starting at a time T sub A, and we're starting at some point A. And we're asking, can we get, say, to B at some time T sub B? Well, what's the amplitude to get there? All right. And we can ask, so there are two questions. Uh, well, we can ask, what's the amplitude to get there? Well, two possibilities. One is that, well, first of all, what do we have to do? Well, let me, let me change colors maybe. Oh gosh, hold on. I'm gonna to switch to green. So one path goes like this, another path, goes like that, but we also have to do some crazy path like that, another path like this, and then path like that and so forth. And we add up all these, we calculate the action for each path, multiply by I over H bar, exponentiate. Well, these are gonna be phase factors that are going to be um, complex phase factors. And of course, they're gonna cancel in most cases. When are they not gonna cancel? Well, suppose there's a path, and let me now maybe switch to blue. Suppose there's a path such that the nearby paths and maybe I'll go back to green again. Oh God. So suppose the nearby paths have almost the same action. If they have almost the same action, then they don't cancel and they add up. And there are an infinite number of them. So you get a substantial number there. But that's if and only if there's a path such that the nearby paths have almost the same action. But that's the statement simply that the action is stationary. And that of course is the basic principle of classical physics. That is, that uh, classical physics is, um, the equations of classical physics follow from the action of any particular classical theory. And then you say, well, the action has to be stationary, or we often say the action has to be the least action. And um, which I guess it typically is, but in some cases it's, it's just stationary. Um, and so what this path integral tells us then is that you're able to get from this point to that point, if and only if there's a path that has stationary action. Well, I'm sorry, I, I said this wrong. It says that you're gonna have a big amplitude to get from, 
from this point to that point, you're going to get have a big amplitude to do that. If there's a path that has, uh, if there's a path of least action, that is to say, if there's a classical path. So that says that the, so in other words, the path interval tells us that the amplitude to get or the probability to get for a particular process to occur is big or substantial if that process is a classical process. So that's, um, that's how, uh, that's how class, uh, the path integral implies uh, classical mechanics or explains classical physics. Um, notice that H bar sets the scale of this stuff. In other words, if the action is macroscopic, then this ratio here, this phase factor is absolutely vast. And so the cancellations if you don't have stationary action, the cance cancellation just wipe you out like crazy because you've got an overall factor here of the average value of the action divided by H bar. And if the action, if the average value of the action is a macroscopic value and H bar is so very tiny, you get a huge number and you multiply by I and you've got just a frequency that's just, you know, it's just it's so high you can't hear it. Um, Anyway, um, on the other hand, suppose you're dealing not with um, distances here, Q, QA and QB and times TA and TB that are macroscopic, but instead tiny time separations, tiny distance separations, so that the action is tiny on this or comparable to H bar. Well, then it doesn't matter and uh, the cancellations don't occur. And, um, the, and essentially then quantum mechanically on a, on a quantum scale, a scale of processes whose actions are small compared to H bar, uh, on that scale, anything can happen. It's only when this ratio is big so that you get the cancellations of the phases that uh, quantum mechanics reduces to classical mechanics. Okay, now let's see if there's something else that I should uh, talk about. If you have more particles interacting, then you have, of course, the action. I'm doing this non-relativistically, the action for one, the action for the other, the minus the potential that could involve them all. Um, here's the action for a free particle. Well, what's the action for a free particle? Well, uh, the kinetic part is going to be the Q dot squared, which is the displacement divided by epsilon is essentially the time. And so you get this expression. And uh, when you finish by putting them all together, you get this expression here, a square root. And now you see it's a square root that's halfway reasonable. It's no longer some, you don't, you don't have an N anymore. N epsilon is TB minus TA. And so this is a perfectly reasonable number. And this is a perfectly reasonable number. And it's E to the IM, change of Qs divided by T. Well, this is the same thing you get from ordinary quantum mechanics. You can derive that expression. And in three dimensions, you get this. So this is the path integral derivation of this. But as I said, the path integrals aren't, uh, are, they're great for some things. They're not great for everything. And uh, in particular, ordinary methods of quantum mechanics to, uh, are um, better ways to derive these expressions. Um, if the action is quadratic, it turns out that you can actually do the path integrals. Um, and um, so what I've, what I've done here is to consider the uh, two paths that differ by um, a detour X of T 
and uh, or or rather the action of a path that's the classical path plus a detour x of t and when you work all that out what you've got is this expression here and uh, this involves all these derivatives of the it's mainly derivatives of the potential with respect to uh, its argument and um, if it's quadratic, then the third and higher der uh, derivatives vanish. And the change from the classical action is just this integral here. And um, it's, it's a factor, it's a, it's, a, it's a number that's independent of the classical path. And so for quadratic actions, the path integral is just the phase factor of the quadratic, uh, the phase factor of the, the is the classical phase factor, um, or it's the phase factor of the classical action times some function of the time differences h bar m and the second derivative um, of the uh, action of the potential. What am I saying? Of the potential. And um, so in particular, it, you, you can think of it as F as this integral here. But the point is that it's a, it's a number and it's not going to depend upon anything except the time It's basically the time derivative. Well, it's an integral of the time derivative at the classical, uh, on the classical path. All right, let me, let's give an example. So the classical path for free particle is, is of course, this is the classical path for a free particle, namely, to go from QA to QB, you just go in a straight line at constant speed. Again, non-relativistically, the action then is this expression here. And so we immediately, actually here the path integral is pretty simple. Um, I've got to admit it's simpler than, probably simpler than ordinary quantum mechanics. And it gives us um, uh, this expression here and some, and apart from that, there's just a function of the time. Oh, um, another nice thing that we can do with um, the uh, with path integrals is the Bohm-Aharonov effect, and uh, this was something that um, caused quite a stir when I think I was a graduate student, or maybe an undergraduate, maybe a high school student. I don't know. It was way back then, and um, the idea is you imagine a relativistic particle mass m char so let me maybe change color what color do i have well i don't know we'll see so what we've got is a magnetic field limited to a cylinder that's coming um out uh, of the ipad or out of the your computer screen and you imagine you have uh, a beam of electrons and they can either go this way or they can go that way to a detector here. And um, so what's, what's the difference in phase that you get for um, these two different paths? Well, essentially the difference is it's this minus that and so it is basically the same as going once around the magnetic field or, um, well, once around the magnetic field. And um, so we, we can actually sort of look at it this way. So you've got the integral, the action, the classical action is the kinetic energy. And then there's a term EA dot V, A dot V, this, um, we're assuming no electric field, just a magnetic field and a static magnetic field. And um, 
So Q dot times DT is just DQ. And um, we can take a Q dot DT out from both terms, basically. And so we have one half M Q dot dotted into DQ and E A dotted into DQ. And the action's quadratic in Q dot, in Q dot, so we can do the path integral very simply. And we know it's nothing more than the function of the time and this phase factor here. And this thing's independent of the path. And um, let me just write a note to myself. This independent of the path is, I, I, need, I need to check that a little more carefully. Anyway, um, so what is the difference between the two, which is equivalent actually to going once around the loop? And so the idea here is that B is non-zero inside here, but outside A is equal to zero. No, A is not equal to zero but B is equal to zero outside. And so the difference is integrating once around the cylinder of magnetic field, MQ dot over two plus EA dotted into DQ over H bar. So that's this thing plus this term. So this is a term that basically depends upon velocity and geometry. And if you keep that constant, and you just vary the strength of the magnetic field, you're going to get this E over H bar B dot DS. And um, B dot, uh, well, it's B dot DL. And so after all the inter, I'm sorry, the integral, integral of A dot DL is the integral of curl of A dot DS. Okay, so this is, so in other words, the integral around the magnetic field like that is the integral of the curl of A, which is B over the surface. And that's, and oh, that's the flux. B dot DS is the flux over H bar times E. And the one over H bar means you're gonna get a big number here. And uh, in fact, that's what they saw. They were able to, um, uh, I, I don't know if they did the experiment or they just predicted that there would be such an effect. And uh, many people said, oh, this is nonsense. There's these vector potentials that uh, mathematical physicists talk about don't really mean anything. Um, and if it's not the electromagnetic field, it's nothing at all. Um, but in fact, um, they, they were able to see fringes as they, or they were able to see that the that the detection rate here, the detection rate um, varied with the strength of the magnetic field, and um, so you could um, go from reinforcing um, uh, phases to canceling phases, and then back to reinforcing phases by steadily increasing or decreasing the magnetic field. And um, so, as I say, that was um, something that amused many and astounded and some and puzzled uh, others. Um, the harmonic oscillator, of course, is our favorite um, system because we can actually do most things that we need to do with a harmonic oscillator. And um, what we've got is doubly quadratic. And so this thing is just some outside factor times the exponential of the classical action over H bar. And if you actually compute this, you can, and you get just this expression here, cosine a constant divided by a sine. And uh, this is the, the classical path here is, is this uh, is given by this expression here. I don't know why it's quite as complicated as it is, but that's what I got. The function f is um, 
is this expression here where this is some constant and this is um, uh, something, something involves the time and this delta s is this uh, thing here. And as you see, there's no classical path here. This is just a, a certain sum. Yeah, that's, that's in fact, that's why um, the classical path is gone. When you, if a thing is quadratic and you take the second derivative, you get a constant. And so uh, the classical path is no longer there, uh, no longer present. And um, that's why we love quadratic tensors. Of course, we're just doing the harmonic oscillator. Um, so this F turns out to be this. Um, and uh, we can actually compute it. And I did, I don't, I suppose this is Cambridge University Press probably wishes I never did this, but anyway, um, what we get is this expression then for the amplitude to go from QA to QB in time, from time TA to time TB, it's quantum mechanically then exactly given by this expression. Um, in statistical mechanics, what we do is we just are computing the Boltzmann operator. And some people, I think they're being simply pretentious. They say, well, we're going to imaginary time. And so we replace T by minus I H bar beta. My, we take T in the time evolution, op, we take the time evolution operator and replace T by minus I H bar over KT. And then we get the Boltzmann operator, but we could have said, well, we just start with the Boltzmann operator and forget about imaginary time, which I, I, I have never heard anybody explain what imaginary time is. Um, anyway, this is called then the partition function. It's the trace of e to the minus beta h. And so we sum over a complete set of states. And now again, to get a path integral, we just do we just do exactly what we did in the case of uh, quantum mechanics? Um, well, this is quantum mechanics, sort of quantum statistical mechanics. And um, so we have this expression here. And uh, well, I, I don't know if we want to get go through all this. What, what, what we wind up with is this, that we, we have this action is an integral, is it's a funny factor now, a real factor times the uh, integral over all the intermediate cues. And we have here then the classical, uh, it's not the, it, it's, it's, well, people call it the Euclidean action. Anyway, it's basically the energy. This is the kinetic energy, this is potential energy. So it's e to the minus energy over h bar is the energy of each of the various fields. And um, to get the full partition function, well, the full partition function is a trace. And so we set QA equal to QN, and we just do that integral. And um, in the low temperature limit, it's, of course, the, the e to the minus beta h and the low, well, e to the minus beta h always is the sum over all energy eigenstates out of product times e to the minus beta, the energy of that state. And um, uh, if we go to, we take beta to infinity, that is to say, we take the temperature to zero, the only thing that survives is the ground state. And um, so that's the limit of e to the minus beta h for, uh, very low temperatures. More generally, we have the maximum entropy density operator is the Boltzmann operator itself divided by its trace. That's the density operator that gives it, that's so the trace of, is, trace of the density operator has to be one. Um, and its matrix elements look like this. And in three dimensions, these things look like that. And the the Boltzmann uh, partition function then is this, this integral. And um, 
in three dimensions. Uh, well, uh, the density operator for free particle, then you have e to the minus just the kinetic energy and you path integrate that. And after some huffing and puffing, you get the um, uh, partition function is the length of the interval times this factor here, um, which, which is basically square root of the temperature. And if you go to high temperatures, well, I shouldn't have skipped, it's T to the three halves because we're now in three dimensions times this thing, which is um, basically a constant. Um, again, for quadratic actions, things simplify a great deal. And in particular for the harmonic oscillator, the action is just this very simple expression. And um, then we can take average values of time ordered products. Now, a time ordered, now in the Heisenberg picture, the position operator at time t looks like this. Any other operator is just, you just stick it in between e to the ih over h bar and e to the minus i th over h bar. And um, in, in, um, if we're doing finite temperature, then what we have instead of, uh, we take set u equal to h bar beta and it's e to the minus u h over h bar and so forth. And um, time ordered product then is, it's, it's q at the later, uh, later time times q of the earlier time. And the same thing in if they're, the time evolution operators. And um, we can then get the, the average value in the nth quantum state of the time order product of Q of Q, T1, Q of T2. It turns out it's just Q of T1 times Q of T2 in the path integral. And in the both, if you have many Qs, you just put them there. And so that's a simplifying thing. You just put them in as their classical values. And then to normalize it correctly, you divide by this simple path integral. And that's why these, D, these capital DQs uh, go away. And, um, and so then if you go to the average value in the vacuum, you get expressions like this. And uh, in fact, this, this is the starting point of things like lattice quantum chromodynamics or many other things. Um, this is the ground state. You have the Qs here, either minus the energy. It's basically just classical energy over H bar. And um, now quantum field theory on a lattice, um, in fact, this is one way of thinking about what quantum field theory is. Um, in ordinary, if we have quantum mechanics of n coordinates and n conjugate momentum, then momenta, then we impose these commutation relations. Um, and uh, so what we do in quantum field theory is we replace Q of X. The, well, first of all, we replace the, we, we associate, we, for each point in space, we associate an index I. For each value of momentum, we associate an index K. And then we replace Q sub X by phi of X and P of X by pi of X, just to confuse everybody, keep the chemists out of the field. Um, and then we have the commutator of phi of x with pi of x prime, just imitating this. It's i h bar instead of a chronica delta is now a, an actual delta function. These commutators vanish, so these ones vanish. Let me say right off the bat here that this is what everybody does and it's the natural generalization, but I think this is the root of all the infinities in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is beset by all these bloody infinities. And um, this is where they start from. Uh, 
it is nuts to have something equal to a delta function um, of position. And it's, that's, you know, where, where, where the problems arise. Um, and so you young people, um, if you want to, well, one possible way to make progress is to tell us all what's the right way to improve, to go from ordinary quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. What, what is the improvement of this expression here? I don't know. I don't think anybody does, um, but eventually uh, somebody will, I think. Assuming uh, we survive Omicron, Pi, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon, Phi, Ki, C, Omega, all these different variants. Um, to make path integrals then we replace uh, space by a, a three-dimensional lattice of points. X is some lattice spacing times these integers i, j, and k. So a, i, a, j, a, k. We eventually let a go to zero and we have phi at this position, pi at this, the commutator is this product of quantica deltas divided now by a cube. So that's how we sort of get a delta function. And um, we then just ape quantum mechanics and get these uh, formulas here. We go through the same, we turn the same cranks that I've shown you now twice how to turn and um, what do we get? Well, we get that the time evolution operator to go from the field, from one field to another, is this uh, integral of this phase factor, the phase factor, I guess I've said h bar equal to one. It's the classical action divided by h bar d phi. And um, so let me put a notice, I was, putting in all the H bars and C's and somehow, I mean, it's okay to set H bar to one. That's what I always do when I'm doing things. I set C equal to one. And of course, some people set Newton's constant equal to one. Um, in fact, that was the original system of natural units that, um, oh, I think it was Planck introduced. Anyhow, um, classical processes, well, you just let the field um, look like this. And, excuse me, um, you can take a Fourier transforms of it and um, you then get that the average value in the state N of the time order product of the fields, it's just the ordinary fields the classical action normalization factor. Finite temperature field theory, you just do the same thing, but replace action by energy. You get this expression. Here's the Boltzmann factor then. Uh, and um, Euclidean time ordered product of Euclidean field operators is this. And um, Basically, this is then the expression used in lattice gauge theory. Well, we're basically out of time. Um, does anybody want to shoot a question at me? Because I undoubtedly, I obviously compressed an awful, an awful lot of stuff into, um, into one lecture uh, and um, on the other hand, you, I hope, have a copy of the book, and so you can read it at your leisure. Um, okay, I don't see a question, so I'll I'll just say um, um, good evening, and um, I hope you all stay healthy. Remember, as we've just seen today, this. Uh, these viruses are airborne and um, uh, you should absolutely be fully vaccinated and boosted. 
but even so, um, even if you're boosted, I think this is the uh, Omicron is likely to be as bad as uh, having the flu if you're vaccinated. Because I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Um, at least not the sort of doctor who actually makes money um, in this country. Um, oh, I meant to say uh, next semester, um, I'm teaching an online course that's too elementary for any of you to take it, take, but I'm offering a 500 seminar and, and it's in basically whatever the students want within reason. Um, so any topic that's in the book, my book, is, is, is something I'd be happy to talk about. Um, another possibility is something in quantum field theory or particle physics or general relativity, gravitational physics, and so forth. Um, but I say within reason. And if, 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 some, if people really want me to do some string theory, um, I'll be happy, of course, to do the chapter that's in the book. But that only scratches the surface of string theory. Uh, if you want to go further in string theory, um, I will um, try to put something together for you. But I must say, I've never actually worked seriously. I, I've never actually worked in string theory. Um, uh, but uh, I'm willing to do a 500 seminar on it if, if that's what students want. If, but you have to be forewarned that you're not going to be taught by an expert in string theory. You'll be taught by somebody who's um, uh, We'll be learning it um, as we proceed. All right, well, have a nice uh, weekend and well, have a nice uh, holidays, a nice spring semester, a nice life. And um, uh, happy holiday, Professor. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, be careful. Guns and Cars are really dangerous. Drugs are dangerous, and this virus is dangerous. So you've got to you've got to be careful. All right, I'll I'll say goodbye then, and stop. Bye.